in the 1903 uh, logic lectures, Peirce says that the whole universe is a poem. Yeah. Right. And so we're we're trying to we're trying to interpret this poem of experience, uh, which is just a terrific little thing, you know, um, yeah. because you know uh, what's the meaning of a poem? Um, you know, it's not it's not the kind of thing you can just you know nail down. It's not like finding a solution yeah. to, to a formula, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, the 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 interpretation of a poem is arriving at a meaning that itself unfolds in other possible kinds of ways. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a it's a beginning. It's not certainly not an end. Yeah, it's an ending interpretational process. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if it has any kind of a a, a progressively understood kind of sense to it it is that it invites more meaning as it's in, as as you inquire into it hello fellow sand lovers i had the great pleasure to talk with professor roger ward from the georgetown college he has written a great book called Purse and religion which i recommend in this conversation we discuss what kind of role religion played in the system of thought of Peirce Purse and how it was maybe one of the main drivers of Peirce's whole intellectual pursuit. Enjoy the conversation. So are you teaching a lot of courses about Peirce in, in the university? <clears throat> so yeah, um, I teach the American philosophy course. Uh, so we don't have a course specifically on Peirce, but we yeah. have a general uh, it's more of a historical survey of American philosophers. We start with um, Edwards, of course, and Emerson, Thoreau, <clears throat> work our way up through Peirce, James Dewey, and then on to some more contemporary folks like Du Bois and um, Cornell West. I've been adding Jane Addams quite a bit mm. lately. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jane Addams. Not, not really. Yeah, yeah. She's, uh, she's, almost, she's a pretty near contemporary of, of Peirce. Okay. Um, and probably they mixed in some societies with folks in Chicago where she was based. So they probably had some mutual friends. Of course, William James was a, a, a strong influence on Jane Addams. Uh, and of course, William James was, you know, Purse's best friend. So <clears throat> they would have had that, that kind of mutual contact. But would you have a special interest in Purse, right? Because uh, then you have, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and I, I, sometimes I try to downplay it a little bit when I teach the survey course, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we get enough other, other material. Um, but, um, yeah, I started reading purse, uh, as a graduate student when I was mm. at Baylor, Baylor university. And the, the first encounter I had was in, um, uh, justice Buckler's <clears throat> little, uh, edited volume of American philosophers. And uh, I kept reading the, the purse selections. And of course, Buckler was very naturalistic, um, kind of downplayed any of the religious element <clears throat> in purse. And even in that, those selections, I kept picking up references that really made me wonder about purse's background. So when I got to uh, Penn State and began to work with um, um, Doug Anderson and Vincent Colapietro, um, my, and, uh, uh, who's the other Carl Hausman, um, my interest in purse really kind of expanded. Um, I began to focus more on sort of a philosophy of religion aspect of purse. So, and I got to know, um, uh, Michael Raposa. Have you met Michael Raposa by any chance? I haven't met, but I, I, I bought his book. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, from '89. I don't remember yeah, yeah. the title, but but the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Repose is really good. Um, yeah. Such a such an excellent, careful scholar, which I I admire because I'm not one. <laughs> 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 I tend to be, you know, I'm not sure how I describe myself, but um, so anyway, I began following up, you know, some of these leads that I'd picked up about Purse over the years, and um, wrote some wrote some essays that got you know accepted into publication. Um, so they were, he was, Purse was a significant part of my dissertation. Um, and then, um, later when I began to, to really focus on, um, a second stage in my, in my work, um, Purse became very important 
And so I spent a good long time digging into his more of his narrative, more of his biography. Um, and that was really what inspired the book that I that I wrote here about person religion. Yeah, the, the biographical aspect is really um, it's a bit uncommon in per scholarship. It is. I really I really liked it. And uh, and um, it brings uh, the person to life and especially, you know, the early chapters about the influences of purse. In the father Benjamin and the right, first wife, right. and and then this preacher at the yeah, college. That, which, yeah. Was that a new founding, or I, I haven't heard about him? Yeah, that was completely new to me. Um, yeah, I picked up a reference to um, uh, the name Frederick, uh, and I'm just going to pass on his last name right now. Um, in a in a in a reference in a book about Purse by. A uh, guy from uh, Texas A&M, uh, sort of a, a novelization of Purse's life, and he mentions this guy, uh, who was uh, his logic teacher. Oh. And so then I began to look into it and found that he was not just a logic teacher, but he was also the Harvard, uh, the preacher to the campus. And that began to really puzzle me. So then I, I found a collection on Google Books of his sermons that he that he preached while he was at Harvard and he was there for four years, five years. And then he got turned out. Oh, he left because um, uh, he was hired as a Unitarian. And then he became convinced that Unitarian was wrong. And so he became Episcopal, yeah. which is exactly what Peirce did. So they, they were very similar in their, in their religious trajectories. Um, Hopkins is that guy's name. Um, and, so that that was a that was a new discovery for me, and that when I, once I, I began to read his language in these sermons, I began to to it, they really echoed how Peirce continually referred to some of the same some of the same ideas. <clears throat> so I realized that he had a pretty big pretty large impact on Peirce. Yeah, and, and the 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 biographical aspect is quite interesting also for the fact that um, this is not a sort of a systematic philosophical academic book like i think the raposa's book is more like that but this right. is a sort of a it's a very personal book about person you you wrote uh, in the beginning that it's a it's a book about or your object of inquiry is is purse himself in a sense yeah and i really like that and you know um this religious aspect uh you know it's it's not the the main topic in purse scholarship by no means no but it's very interesting how that religious drive or motivation that Peirce ha had, that this kind of a personal belief, how fundamental that was to the trajectory of Peirce's philosophy. Like that was sort of a, the driver in a sense. Would you say, would you say something like I, that? that? That's what I was, I, I, I wrote the book primarily to see if that hypothesis was so. Mm -hmm. um, and here, here's, um, I don't know how you got into purse, but I got into purse by reading the collected papers, right? The, you know, and there are these really toward the end of purse's life. He has several documents where he's talking about Christianity, about the church. And these seem so discontinuous with anything else he did. I wondered if he got like knocked on the head, you know, yeah. if he had something really shake him up. <clears throat> so I began to wonder how did we get from, you know, the purse that we know, uh, you know, in the, the the cognition series, you know, these great series of essays? Um, how did we get from there to how he's writing at the end of his life? Because most most commentators will say something like, you know, he had some kind of an interesting religious turn at the end of his life. And at, as I was reading it, I I began to pick up references earlier thinking this doesn't seem like something that only shows up at the end of his life. So where, where does this come in? And that's when I began to look back at his, his early life and biography a bit more. Um, and that really helped, you know, kind of okay. string things together to, to, to see that it was, uh, there was a consistent um, concern Purse had um, throughout his life. And it goes through some significant changes, you know, at different time periods. Um, but that provided a different kind of continuity to his philosophy 
than I read in other places. And so that's really what I was exploring. Yeah, yeah, because I had the same kind of idea that yeah, Peirce was interested in religion. He wasn't he wasn't an atheist by no means. Right. But the religious aspect matured when he grew older or, or it became more prominent in the later years. But I guess the picture in your book is that it was always there. Yeah. And it was sort of the I could I guess you could say the main doubt and um that he want, wanted to answer and and of course there is the logic of relatives or the semiotics of purse which That's he correct. saw yeah. as a divine calling <laughs> yes is, right right which, which is pretty religious to me <laughs> I think, yeah i think so and you know and <clears throat> you know purse's favorite gospel was the gospel of john yeah <clears throat> and in john it's structured around signs you know so the mm. whole gospel of john is you know book of signs yeah. and i think that 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 influenced Purse's own understanding of, you know, his own semiotic, you know, because we can only understand something <clears throat> as as vague and indeterminate as God by interpreting signs that appear in our experience. And so that that began to kind of filter into into place. Yeah, uh, you have a very uh, thought provoking uh, chapter names uh, there in the beginning, <laughs> a conversion to logic, yeah. Yeah. A conversion to community. Could you? Yeah. Tell us what you mean by conversions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, two things. Um, yeah. I mean, a conversion in a, in a religious context is usually a marked transformation of some kind. Um, and I was struck, I always wondered where Peirce got this logic thing, because, you know, the study, the professional study of logic did not exist um, in, in the United States. Oh. Um, and so he was, when he, um, I tell a little vignette, um, when he, one of his brothers dies, <clears throat> I think in South Dakota, and he and his father, Benjamin, go on a train to collect the body of, of his brother and bring it back to, to, um, to Massachusetts. Um, and on that train ride, he has this kind of a, an argument with his father about pursuing logic as a career. And his father's like, chemistry, you're a chemist, do that. And Purse is kind of like sold out that he wants to follow logic as a as a career as a core you know, discipline of a career and i think that emerges from this early work that he does he has his scholarship <clears throat> to do some lectures at cambridge um he does 11 lectures he another couple of years later he does another set of lectures he's reading the british logicians and he begins to form um an entire kind of approach to philosophy grounded in logic which was really rather different than anybody else at that time. Mm. Um, and that's why I kind of call it a conversion to logic, because it, it took a commitment uh, of his own career to explore this kind of way of doing philosophy that was discontinuous with whatever else, you know, there, there was to be done. Um, so that, that, that personal conviction, and he really felt like it was his job to do this logic thing, um, and he really sold out to it. I mean, before there were jobs for philosophers in logic, he was trying to get a job teaching logic. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I had the idea that this conversion to logic would also mean the idea of this external object. Or, I think or that's this, right. Um, <clears throat> Sort of the, the Christian term would be logos, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that logic is not psychological; it isn't uh, dependent on our minds. Uh, and you know, in the architectonic of sciences, logic yeah. comes before metaphysics, so right. it's it precedes that. So it's very sort of a. I guess you could say that logic is the most fundamental ontological level of reality in a I, sense. I agree. But, yeah, but. Uh, but the idea that there is this external object sort of guiding our inferences or we are mimicking uh, our, our, we want to make our inferences to conform to this external object. Uh, so is that there also? In yeah. The logic, <clears throat> so let me, let me readdress that in one, one little yeah. tiny way. Please. Um, the, you mentioned the non-psychological character of logic. And this is one of Peirce's first kinds of discoveries that separate him from John Stuart Mill and other 
of the British logicians who understood that logic was really a study of just how we think. And when when Peirce makes this claim and it's, he spends two, two lectures of his first series arguing this point that logic is not psychological, that there are laws to thought that are independent of just how we think. And, and for him, I think that entails um, logic itself as entering into a, a, a pretty interesting and unspecified domain of reason. So I don't think he was inspired first by the object. I think the uh -huh. object emerges as a result of his realization that logic is not psychological. And once he once he makes that that break into a non psychological logic, um, then he has to understand or think about what gives logic its coherence, and that's when he arrives at something like an object. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the object the object is a result of his conviction about the the non psychological shape of logic. Mm, oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, okay. And and what about the. Uh the conversion to community. Right. So uh, the second, the, this chapter on uh, the second conversion that I talk about um, is his realization that anything that can ground logic must also work in the form of a, it must work in the form of a community. And this, this relates back to the, um, the cognition series and his understanding that <clears throat> his own personal identity is really a matter of inference not of intuition. So even to establish something as basic as our own identity, it requires a community. So if you're going to explore the function of logic, you're basically having to understand how thought moves primarily through community. Um, and again, that, that separates him very, very clearly from the Cartesian and the Enlightenment model. Um, yeah. And so he's, he's on a whole different, whole different track. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very different track, and and the ideas sound a bit strange to our our minds, like yeah. like the the idea about that a, a logical inquirer must be self-sacrificing to the community yeah. in a yeah. sense, like yeah. that is a very odd <laughs> sounding idea, and yeah. uh, I have hard time to really understand what what is meant by that. So let me, so and this is at the end of, um, I think the validity, validity of the laws of logic, that third essay of the cognition series in 1868. And um, uh, Peirce is examining the idea of how an individual inquirer can participate in a logical uh, production of, of, of inference um, realizing that the individual is not really determining either the motivation or the outcome, but is participating sort of like jumping into a stream. Yeah. And realizing <clears throat> that our participation in inference as a the, the, the life of a community means we have to kind of give up our own hold on our identity and whatever goal we think we're, we're, we're finding and just kind of go with the inquiry of the community. And the only way logic functions is if we are willing to do this kind of sacrifice where we, we kind of let go of our ego in order to enter into the community of inquiry. It's a really striking passage. I mean, he's got, uh, yeah. he's got some very messianic language going on there. Yeah, yeah, but it it makes sense to me. Yeah, because I had this kind of uh, simple, just this kind of simple idea that if you're very selfish, uh, then you're trying to uh, manipulate people, maybe bend the world towards your desires, and that is you you have to necessarily be untruthful in a sense. Right. But if you are uh, you know, following the truth, pursuing the truth, no matter what the cost, then right. obviously you're not selfish in a sense. Exactly, right. You have right. to make sacrifices. So, but yeah. that's that's how I, I thought about it. Yeah. Yeah, and the language of sacrifice, I mean, he, he comes back to this um, uh, in a later, let me see if I can re pull it up in memory. Um, he deals with the idea of sacrifice in a couple of different ways. And sometimes he's okay with it. 
and sometimes he's resisting it, which is really interesting because he he kind of plays with it in his own thinking. Um, so um, at the end of um, the uh, the the uh, oh, it's one of the last essays in the Scientific Logic series, eighteen seventy eight. Um, order of nature. And he begins to un unpack um, a thesis that he's pursuing <clears throat> about the order of nature. And he's, he's skeptical at this point. Um, and I, I'm, I make a biographical point here because this is right after his wife has left him. Um, so he's kind of in despondent uh, state. And his um, father died, right? His father died like two years later, like the end, uh, like a year later, like yeah. um, uh, 1889, I think his father dies. Yeah, okay. So, um, but so his his father had just given lectures at Johns Hopkins um, on his philosophy, which was very religious. Mm. Um, and it was sort of a combination of of evolutionism uh, and 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 sort of divine creation kind of put together. Um, and I think Peirce is responding to this. I think he's he's kind of distancing himself from his father at the same time and playing out this, what he calls an atheistic conclusion, that there is no order of nature, um, which seems to be the principle you'd have to go with if you were just using inquiry in a, in a naturalistic kind of way. Right, that there's no real principle that all it is is what we're finding by our own inference, and he has this passage where he's lamenting what this would mean. You know, this would mean you'd have to give up so, some of your religious beliefs and your celebrations. Um, and what would it be like if if you had to if you had to sacrifice that kind of aspect of your life for this this philosophical kind of scientific naturalism? So it really is striking to me when people qualify Peirce as sort of a, you know, a hard-headed scientific naturalist, because I think he was always, he, he kind of plays with that notion, but I think in the end, he's, he's, he's reluctant uh, to kind of identify that way. Yeah, well, that's a sort of, a, I, I, I like Peirce because there are these two sides, which I thought were I'm, I'm impossible to have in, in one coherent philosophy. There is this kind of strict logical yeah. naturalistic tendency. And then there is this very sentimental, poetic, yeah. aesthetical aspect of Peirce. And they come together very beautifully and mm. very coherently. So right. that, is, that yeah. is the aspect that really drew me into Peirce cool. in the first yeah. place. But... Um, yeah, this, is, this was also one of, one of the things I really, really thought about. Uh, that, uh, that in this phase of person's life or the, in, in, this, in this essay, there is this sort of, I conceptualized it as sort of this kind of Darwinian adapt, adaptive kind of model and then this kind of Persian participation kind of. I agree. Thinking that we can, so, so this um, Darwinian idea is that we are systems adapting to our environment and we produce habits that are in harmony with the environment but the environment is always immediate and uh, it, it, um, it's not very general or it, it's it's limited it's limited and yeah. there may be no like uh, super order or super habits in the cosmos it's just a mess of generalities and uh, there is no uh, coherence in the cosmos in itself. Right, right. Whereas the the other idea, the Persian participation idea, is that there is this coherence, this ultimate telos in the cosmos that we can participate with through through these habits, self controlled habits of action. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah it's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think, uh, and I think your point, uh, what what really kind of comes out. In a, in a longer in, a, in this longitudinal you know kind of work that I that was doing in this book is that that's a hard won conviction about the this the, what what Raposa calls the theosemiotic you know that there's a there's an approach to to signs and habits that 
have you know this this uh this meaning what what's the um in the 1903 uh logic lectures per says that the whole universe is a poem yeah right and so we're we're trying to we're trying to interpret this poem of experience uh, which is just a terrific little thing you know um yeah. because you know uh what's the meaning of a poem um you know, it's not it's not the kind of thing you can just, you know, nail down. It's not like finding a solution yeah. to, to a formula. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, the 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 interpretation of a poem is arriving at a meaning that itself unfolds in other possible kinds of ways. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a it's a beginning. It's not certainly not an end. Yeah, it's an ending interpretational process. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and if it has any kind of a, a, a progressively understood kind of sense to it it is that it invites more meaning as it's in as as you inquire into it so it's yeah. this uh what does uh carl hausman call this the um uh evolutionary theology te evolutionary teleology right the closer you get to it the deeper and more interesting it becomes <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and then this this was one one thing that became much clearer to me was the idea of dynamic teleology. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there is kind of two ways to think about that. One way is to think about uh, dynamic teleology as the telos can itself change. Right. Like, you know, evolution of whales. Like yeah. First they wanted to adapt to uh, earth and then, then back to water. Right. So the whole telos like changed. But... I guess in in this sense, this theosemiotic sense, the telos stays the same, but the dynamic nature of it means that it can pull the multiplicity back to itself. Like mm -hmm. it creates new things, creates novelty, but it all comes back to that same poem or that same yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of symphony or however, mm -hmm. <laughs> however you well, want to Well, yeah, and the, and the truth, whatever the truth turns out to be, yeah is just what provides the coherence for ongoing inquiry. Mm. So the truth isn't like, you know, it's not that the end of the, the train station, but it is yeah. what, what provides the, the ability for inquiry to continue to kind of develop um, and, and cohere around, you know, around a, a, a pursuit. And, and, and this, idea of transformation which is uh, in the subtitle mm -hmm. of the book yeah i find yeah. i i find it very interesting very interesting idea that there are these generalities these living generalities or living facts or living tendencies you know, mm. name it uh and <clears throat> sort of the darwinian view would be that okay these are laws of nature or these are ecological tendencies and we have to adapt to to them so that we don't die and this is sort of kind of a brutal <laughs> yeah. brutal kind of relationship that yeah. we have survival. to obey, yeah. obey these we have to survive we have to shield ourselves from these these laws uh, by creating these habits whereas this transformation idea is more like we can participate with these generalities yeah. and we can uh, form uh, habits of action we can form principles of action and by that, we don't shield ourselves from these things, but we participate with them and they become or, or they live through us in the sense in, in the world. And we are uh, instruments of these generalities. Right. That was very like, yeah. <laughs> I, I really love that idea. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, the, the, the transformation through a kind of logical participation in the universe is yeah, a really yeah. fantastic kind of thing, you know, it's great, um, <laughs> because it, it, it means you can't sit on, you know, you can't just sit on the sideline and just watch things, but that all your, all our, our mo motivations to inquiry are actually uh, efforts uh, for something that's trying to change us, you know, <laughs> trying to yeah. trying to shape us into some form of truth that, that we're on the way toward. Um and you know, the, I think this is Peirce's notion of sort of you know whatever is um, uh, what is ever how we participate in the life after our physical life is over is that you know we're kind of transformed into these ideas that continue to become more and more articulate uh, through inquiry. And if we can participate in our in our living inquiry, we become part of that process. 
So we kind of live on through these ideas as they continue to to develop, which is pretty cool, you know. Yeah, it's it's very cool, and I really like this this idea of embodiment mm. that uh, you become those generalities. Yeah, and that's a it's a it's a full participation with the cosmos. Like there is right. no 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 border between us and the cosmos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and this is another thing that uh, real I really thought about was the in in one point of the book you talk about how Peirce talk about these three types of men uh, yeah. perceiving the world and thirdness. Yeah. So there is the nominalist, the hardcore nominalist to say yeah. there is no thirdness, there is no generality, everything is particular. Yeah. Then there is the the second man who says, yeah, there is thirdness, but we cannot perceive it, but yeah. we can sort of infer it through secondness. Yeah. And then there is the third man that says, yeah, we can perceive thirdness. <laughs> right. The man of science. Right. The man of science. Yeah. And, you know, and this perceiving thirdness is a very sort of, it's a mystical thing. <laughs> like, it's a very mystical thing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if I understand right, the thirdness or the bridge between, I don't know if these are the right terms, but the, the thirdness of our minds and the thirdness of the, the external reality. Yeah. The bridge between those are abductions. That's correct. And especially, you know, the, the fundamental perceptual abductions, perceptual judgments, you know, right. the, the right. building blocks of. Right. Of, yeah. Of and I think this is indicated, I think, um, also, I think it's in the adediment to the neglected argument, you know, the last essay that he wrote, <clears throat> where he talks about there is the possibility of an argument for God from the universes of experience, at least from two of them. And he leaves yeah. it he leaves it vague. And Doug Anderson and I have a we we disagree about this, <laughs> um, but uh, I think Peirce wanted to exclude. The, the man of secondness, mm. that that's not the position from which you can get an argument for God. You can get an argument from God from firstness, that openness to experience and and perception, and from from thirdness, yeah. right? So those are the two universes of experience, I think, uh, where someone could actually have an argument from God for God kind of emerge. Yeah, yeah, but this... Uh this bridge between us and the reality is very, very interesting. And do you see it that way that this external object, we may say it's symbols, these living generalities have the nature of a symbol, right? But these symbols are communicating their form, their general form to us in these perceptual judgments in some very primitive, iconic form, I guess. You're right, right. And I think Peirce's language would be, they they are finding a way to get themselves thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something, something like that, yeah. Whether or not that's a direct, you know, sort of a, a interfering influence or just, you know, being the result of a tendency with an inference, you know, some way that, that these things are, are regularly getting thought, yeah. Yeah, but the, that that sounds very mystical to me. <laughs> like symbols talking to us through throughout abductive yeah. perceptions. Well, you know, very... were, uh, early in one of Purse's um, journals, um, this would have been while he was still a student at at, at Harvard. Eighteen sixty. I'm thinking it's eighteen sixty or sixty one. He, he reads an essay and he references this, that he read a book, uh, some French logician who argued that every inference is an action of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think yeah. he, he doesn't, he doesn't deal with it. He just kind of references it and, and mentions it just says, you yeah, know, that's pretty interesting. Um, and I think he just kind of puts it aside. Um, but I don't think that idea ever firmly, Leaves. I don't think he ever completely excludes the possibility that these moments of, of abductive inference have something in them. Um, uh, they're opaque. We can't really we can't see exactly what what's what's perfectly behind them. 
we can only see the results of them. Uh, and then follow that out as our inferences change as a result of following these abductive, you know, suggestions. Um, so I do think that he kind of interjects this a you know, little bit of mystery into into this yeah. abductive co concept. Yeah, because Peirce thinks that abductions are not internal to us. This would That's be correct. the man, the second man saying That's that right. abductions are internal to us. Yeah, and. Uh, then, then I then I thought about okay, if these symbols communicate or make themselves thought, uh, we still make mistakes. Exactly. <laughs> like, um, and there is uh, there is kind of this odd thing that we can go totally against the living generalities right. by you know, living in illusions or right. creating right. what. Uh, Eric Vogelin calls second realities or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so uh, how, how's that possible? Yeah, so, uh, and I think the, the possibility of error is essential for any kind of a logic. If you can't understand what an error is, then you don't really know the principle of inference that you're, that you're following. And so I think the very possibility of realizing error is one of the indications that there's some other standard or, or principle operating outside of our own thinking. Um, so if you if you read through Peirce's, his, all of his work and focus on where he talks about the discovery of error, it's never a negative thing. It's always an essential part of inquiry that we can not only commit an error, but that we can recognize it as an error. Uh, because only if we recognize it as an error are we realizing that that we are still on the pursuit of something beyond what we understand? Uh, so that's a, it's but a real. Also, go ahead. But he also speaks about the slavery to error. Yes, as something yeah, yeah. akin to yeah. sin. Now, so, so if if you take the error, happens. but you you don't use it to you know correct your understanding, but you want to sustain the error, that's a whole. You know, if you're going to take a principle and simply say this is the fixed principle that I'm going to hold to whether or not, you know, it, it, I can determine if it's error or not, then you're, you're kind of blinding yourself. Um, and I think that's, you know, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, the fixation of belief, he talks about, you know, adopting principles from society or authority um, where those, those things can uh because they're artificially fixed in a way, <clears throat> they're not susceptible to being called out as error. And that's when it's likely that these errors become sort of a form of blindness um, that, that are hard to escape. Um, because once you buy into them, then you're reluctant to, to let them go because they form such, such a basis of your model of inquiry, they become sort of your new home. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's harder to kind of break out of you know, some fixed understanding. And I think this is one of the reasons that I, you know, I think one of the, the real concerns about uh, sort of a, a religious understanding of purse is whether or not something like Christianity could become one of those cultural binding kind of fixations that he thinks you need to get beyond. And I think that's, I think that's legitimate. And I think he was concerned about, about that as well. Um, that whenever we, adopt some form of, of understanding or inquiry that we do have to be cautious about how that's affecting, whether we're susceptible to the error of that, that premise, that deeply held conviction. Um, and that just raises, kind of raises the stakes. You know, you need to be convinced and can, you know, follow through with your convictions for inquiry to, to be productive. On the other hand, you got to be curious about those convictions themselves, right? Yeah, and subject yeah. them to, to to challenge. Logic is matter of life and death, right? That's it. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do we know if we err? Like, what's the what's the yeah test? yeah? Um, how do we know if we err? <laughs> that's what that's what the community is. That I really do think that's what the community is for. Yeah. Uh, especially for, you know, his his model of science, where you're sub you're submitting your conclusions for 
review and reproduction and challenge. Um, and also even by ourselves going back and, you know, rethinking or having a, a moment of inquiry that we then revisit and rehearse. So I think there's an, a, there's a, the community of the self in rehearsing its own reasons that can, can, can do something like that error detection. Um, yeah. This, this book made me think about the community of inquirers because that's something that's a term I like to use. That's a ter term that's very commonly used, but what that means, like what is the community of inquirers right. and always, I thought it was something like an uh, Habermasian, like an ideal speech yeah, situation yeah, yeah, yeah. type of thing. Yeah. But after this book, I was thinking, is it like the church? Is it more like the church? <laughs> I, you know, and I, I think he, he uses the church as a model, I think, yeah. of the community of inquiry in several ways. Um, and, and some of these are these uh, essays that he wrote for up in court uh, in the 1890s. Um, He's challenging uh, some ideas about the church, about its own understanding. Um, and he thinks he's got a pretty clear notion that a lot of doctrine, a lot of church doctrine is merely uh, establishing kind of a position to be fixed uh, just in order to be fixed. And that's to him is like the, the spell of death. Hmm. So, but on the other hand, um, to have a, community that's got some, you know, viability over a long period of time, like the church, there must be something about it that indicates it's a search for truth, at least in some elements. And I think that's the little division that he's kind of exploring. You know, how does the church on the one hand represent sort of a doctrinal focus that can be, can be deadly, and at the same time still have this living aspect to it that keeps it oriented toward a truth that's beyond it. Um, and I think you know, there was this essay, and I, I reference it in the text by um, Henry Johnstone about Peirce's interaction with the Episcopal Church in Milford. Mm. Um, and that um, because Peirce was divorced, he was not eligible for membership in the Episcopal Church at that time. Um, and some way, he argues himself onto the church role. <laughs> and it's, it's and, and the space, according to the, the record, where it says, you know, either he came by letter or something else, uh, the reason that he was accepted into membership, that is left blank. <laughs> 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 so I just, I want to imagine, I want to imagine Purse talking to the rector of this Episcopal church about why he should be put on membership. Yeah. You know, I guess Purse is good at arguments. I he's pretty guess. good at arguments. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, according to Henry Johnstone's uh, work um, in this essay, um, Purse was going to daily communion at the church. Mm, yeah. uh, he was exchanging books with the rector. Uh, he actually applied for a teaching position at an Episcopal seminary in New York. So he was not just on the, he was not just sort of, you know, on a fringe kind of basis. I mean, he was pretty much integrated. Here's the, yeah. here's the kick. There was, a, there was an advertisement in the Milford newspaper about a fundraiser for the church. And Purse's wife, Juliet, was doing tarot card readings as a fundraiser. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Which just really tickled me, thinking about, you yeah. know, how, you know, what they were doing. <laughs> yeah oh, oh these biographical uh, touches are great yeah i really yeah. like them yeah uh, yeah um well these things in the book i they, they resonated with a lot of christian ideas with i have you know this embodiment of general generality you know that's mm -hmm. that's something that is very like Christian sounding mm. like theosis or this kind yeah. of participation with the cosmos. And um, I was wondering, this is, a, this may be a, a bit, a bit odd question, but these generalities, these living tendencies, aren't they something like the spirits in, in, in the understanding of the church? Right. Yeah. In the traditional operation yeah. of the, the Trinity, right. You've got the, the father and the son and the Holy spirit. 
and and the the spirit is what mediates you know between the the body and the and the and the godhead so yeah it's very much like the, sort of the the role of the the role of the spirit then i thought and this may be a bit too wild but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought about, you know, that the church's teachings are also that there are bad spirits or evil spirits. Right. So would yeah. this be something like you can participate with and they would lead to uh, habits of action that hmm. don't, that will uh, produce destruction or, sure. or, or yeah, yeah. dissociation or something like that. Yeah. Because that, that, some, that sounded um, logical to me, <laughs> like... Oh, yeah, this is a yeah. logical like explanation of what that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I let me let me think for a minute. Um, yeah. um, I, you know, Peirce has his theodicy is pretty pretty interesting. I mean, he he calls evil um, one of the greatest perfections of the universe, mm -hmm. right? That evil is something that persists in experience. That it is for for us to kind of resist and fight and overcome. And so it's, um, uh, it's not quite a soul building kind of theodicy where evil is good for us individually, but it's sort of, sort of a, a cosmological soul building theodicy that evil persists as um, a sort of a, as a sort of a, a negative content around which inference and inquiry can can work to eliminate so there's a sort of a, an oppositional character to it um and that this is completely different from william james right who argues that there's real evil that there's sort of unredeemable evil in the universe uh so they're 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 kind of different on that point um i think i think james would be more um, amenable to something like an evil spirit mm. uh, in the way that you were describing. I'm not sure Peirce would, would, would claim that there are evil spirits, but that there, there is still evil, but it becomes a sort of a focal point for inquiry and action in relationship to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because th this, this was one of, one of, uh, one of uh, ideas that I had was it because th this sounded like, very logical to me that okay you can participate with uh good tendencies and mm. good generalities yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you can participate with very bad ones yeah i don't have that, that we make it's not only that we make mistakes or we create these second realities but there are there are also uh bad things that want to get thought right right <laughs> like actively yeah. trying to influence us to go yeah. astray yeah yeah i have to think that over i you know I haven't really run that through my purse sieve. I'll have to have to run that yeah. through. Um, yeah, just, interesting. just an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, um, this just just you know, for my own for my own fun. Yeah, I often wonder if you know if I'm if I'm looking at a text, you know, like a, a gospel story. You know, you wonder how someone would in, would interpret it. You know, like the mm -hmm. you know uh, like the demon possession stories in the New Testament. Yeah, I'd, I would really be curious. I'd, I'd pay money if I could get Purse to tell me what he thinks about those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, then, then there was this kind of question about, okay, uh, we want to embody the generalities and participate with the cosmos and become uh, like one with the cosmos. That sounds pretty hippie. Yeah. But um, then what... What is our role in that sense? Are we just trying to copy copy the universe, or do we bring something of our own to the mix? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, um, and this, I think, the answer that Peirce would give may be clearest in his letters to Lady Welby. Uh, these are the kinds of questions that she's she's asking him, and he's he's dealing with, and I I think. What I how I would respond is that for Purse, I think whatever is peculiar about our our own approach to to doubt is what makes us unique as as humans. That what what really constructs our identity 
are the peculiar ways that our our perceptions and our understandings uh, arrive at doubt and then deal with doubt, then that becomes the positive contribution that we can make individually to the community. So uh, it's not necessarily that that we're you know pitching in our our positive uniqueness uh, that gets woven into this the, the glorious cosmos, but that we are as inquirers dealing with with doubts that arise through inquiry and the habits that emerge from our unique reaction to those problems is what becomes a part of the habit of the community that then is you know part of this cosmological uh, development so that's our our participation is living lives of doubt yeah i i guess could could one say that it's um bringing order into existence in a sense. I think so. I think this is why Peirce is fundamentally um, a, a sort of an advocate for creation, that it's not that, that any kind of creation is not a, a one, you know, like a, a, an event that happened at one point, but that, that there's an ongoing creativity and creation in our, in our experience and in inquiry. So that we are in, involved in the creation of uh, the universe of meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, then there is this the big theme: science and religion. Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. The antagonistic pair, uh, and there are a lot of metaphors in the book which I really liked. Like they are, they are dance partners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that they, you did very well. Married, married couple. <laughs> <laughs> There is this kind of uh, there is tension between them. Yeah. But ultimately, they are going to the same direction. Yeah. But how on earth could you resolve that tension? Yeah. <laughs> or can you resolve it? Well, you know, um, yeah, that's a good question. I think science always begs uh, sort of an uh, it the understanding of its of its own purpose. I mean, I think science does, you know, its work best when it's unpacking and understanding and developing, you know, connections between between parts of knowledge. Um, but the thing that science cannot give itself is like um, a, a, an overall purpose or goal uh, or meaning. And I think that's where this, you know, this 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 ob this interesting marriage between science and religion that he talked that Peirce talks about. I think that's where it kind of comes comes into being that, um, um, uh, you know, any kind of any kind of philosophy that excludes uh, the participation on science is just going to be completely ungrounded from reality. But on the other hand, if you have a science that's not conversant with or open to questions of meaning, it's just going to be, you know, turning the crank and finding out new ways to describe processes. But not having anything for which those processes contribute. Um, so you can't replace, you can't replace the one with the other, uh, but you can only really have them in combination in some form. And the dance is a nice metaphor, you know, they kind of yeah, move together of and, you know, they probably trip occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, science, science led to, led to itself. It's a, it's a bit dangerous thing because, you know, we mix, mix. We have a, a sort of a false understanding of the telos of science being technology. Like That's right. science is about technology. Yeah. And if we can implement it, we must implement it. And no, nobody like <laughs> sits yeah. down and okay, should we implement it? Is yeah. it gonna bring us to the purpose we are striving towards? Yeah. And and can science uh, ground itself to some <clears throat> purpose? Right. Right. That would you know sometimes say that yeah we can we could do this but we won't <laughs> yeah yeah i just reviewed a book about um uh, the the uh, mutually assured destruction the logic of nuclear deterrence mm. and it's just frightening <laughs> you know it's clearly <laughs> here's technology that was developed and then whatever logic nations had in order to to manage what they were capable of doing 
uh, completely escaped any any limitation. Mm. And so the only way that the logic of deterrence works is if you accept its failure, which is just really scary. You know, that that the only thing keeping us from nuclear an annihilation is basically if people don't follow out their logic accurately. <laughs> just, just like, that's a, that's a frightening... <laughs> <laughs> and one of yeah. the theories, one of the nation theories with, with nuclear armaments is to appear as a madman, right? If you appear so erratic um, and you have a nuclear weapon, then no one's going to attack you. Yeah. So you have to appear completely illogical <laughs> in order for the deterrence to actually to work on an international scale. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a great system. Yeah, it's a great system. Yeah, so you have to you rationally act as an irrational actor, which you know. <laughs> um, I, I had this idea also that um, is is religion or the or the the place of religion in the architectonic of science somewhere mm. in the aesthetics ethics region kind of grounding logic, or is this complete? No, I, I would I would agree. No, I, I think the I think the the approach that Peirce will follow is um, from ethics, of course, to aesthetics, um, mm -hmm. and religion. I think somehow uh, arises as both um, either the 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 coordinating impulse of ethics, um, why why it's important to to think about right action. I think is essential for any any kind of what he calls the um, um, normative. The, so the normative character of ethics has to emerge at some point where there's an obligation, not simply to the other, but to a standard. Uh, I think yeah. that's what I think that's what grounds ethics, and then the appropriation of whatever that is that grounds the standard becomes the content for aesthetics. Um, so the, the very ability of some, some, some standard of, of, of beauty or wholeness that emerges, that incorporates not only ethics, but also this practical side of life. I think that's what, what aesthetics kind of kind of does. So I think religion doesn't, it's not really occupied by either one, but I think the relation of them is what, what grounds uh, for purse uh, anyway, something like his religious impulse. Yeah, this, this was an a interesting idea that, that uh, in our ethical actions, there's a sort of coherence. Yeah. And we are not erratic with our ethical behavior. Yeah. That yeah. We, we want to be coherent. <laughs> we, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a new project uh, on community, and I'm looking at, at Jane Addams as one of the founding sort of voices of community thinking in, in American philosophy. And her, her frame, and she gets this from Tolstoy, is that this, um, this uh, pursuit of righteousness, mm -hmm. that it has to precede everything else. If you don't, if a person's not concerned about righteousness, then you can't really, you can't do, do much with, with them, or they aren't able to participate in much if, if there's not this ground or this impulse I think Peirce would say an instinct uh, for doing the right thing, but and which is I think a really nice way to kind of connect up Peirce and uh, Jane Adams. So that's that's kind of what I'm working on now. Yeah, and Peirce speaks a lot about sentiments. Absolutely, and connects sentiments with the soul. That's correct. Yeah. And how how is that connection made? Well, <clears throat> I think the 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 sentiments are those principles that emerge um, in a way that we, that are, he, he uses this term opaque in the sense that they're not, they don't explain themselves, but they're present, but they can be then inquired into. Mm -hmm. So these are the principles that guide our action um, as if by instinct that we can then make a subject of inquiry about. So they, we, we have them, um, and then we can base our inquiry about them to to discover what where they're linked um, and how they're how they're representative of other kinds of principles. Um, one of the references to sentiments that I 
that really helped me on on understanding this in purse uh, was in again in the cognition series. Uh, he talks about these sentiments that ground almost all of our thought. And he says, and these are pretty well displayed. Uh, he thinks in uh, in the Pauline corpus of the of the New Testament, faith, hope, and love. Um, he thinks these are grounding sentiments that really enable us to see our own action in correspondence to a tradition and other people. Um, but that the the argument for them is this that the, that they emerge uh, in our experience. And and this uh, inquiry into the sentiments that's self reflection, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that self reflection happens when we we do not reflect our soul per se, but the action. Yeah. What those sentiments <clears throat> cause. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I this uh, this ability to really uh, unpack our own habits. Uh, into what's motivating them, but also what, what grounds them, I think is a, a really interesting way of thinking about pragmatism. Most people don't think about pragmatism as sort of this introspective kind yeah. of examination of, of individual sentiments. Uh, but I think Peirce opens that door. Yeah, you, you, the way you speak about pragmatism or pragmatism mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> is very yeah. interesting that it, yeah. there is this we spoke about all already about the transformation, but that is something that if you want to become a pragmatist or want to use this method, it yeah. will transform you. <laughs> like, right. Yes. It's not yeah. just an intellectual kind of a fun game, but it will result in the transformation of sentiments, which is a very yeah. real thing. Exactly. In life. Yeah. And I think that's, um, so in uh, what pragmatism is, I think it's a 1905 essay that he wrote for the monist. Um, Peirce presents a little um, uh, a little description of pragmaticism, um, and he's mainly going after William James. Um, and one of the things that I think he 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 wants to react strongly against William James is that in James. Uh, the action that arises from our our response, from our experience, is like the whole of our meaning. And Peirce is pretty, ad pretty adamant that if that's all that it is, it's not going to get us anywhere. There's no transformation, and we're just reacting. And pragmaticism is looking for the transformation possible in those moments of interaction. So I think that's one of the ways that he's trying to separate himself uh, from James on that point. Yeah, yeah, that was a very interesting point, uh, point as well. And I, I call the pragmatism of James sort of vulgar pragmatism or crude right. pragmatism. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the you know everything is in the in the ends, everything is in the practice, and this is sort of the common view of what pragmatism is. It's yeah. sort of crude instrumentalism. Yeah. But first, by by having this. Realist, realist view of cosmos sees that the generalities are the thing. They are like the the reality. We that's right. That that's the deepest reality in a sense. Yeah. And the meaning is there in these living generalities, and that that's cannot right. be constrained to one particular event. You know, in, right. to the to the universe of secondness, but that is in the universe of thirdness. Right. And in, in that sense, the meaning is living and we participate with it through habits, not right. through action. <clears throat> right, uh, right, right. Yeah, I agree with all that. That's that's a good way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it, you know at one point you said that, I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing, but something that pragmatism never ends or something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> and this really, like, I, I, I have this kind of uh, own experience with pragmatism. You know, first times I, I read about it, the first years, it was like, I get it, but yeah. I don't get it at all. Yeah. Like, I, under, I understand, <laughs> but I don't understand it at all. Yeah. And I, I, it always felt like I have, to, I have to read just a little bit more and then yeah. it will click. Yeah. And it never yeah. clicked. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember in, in the first graduate seminar I had where we were reading uh, Purse and James, 
um, the professor, um, he, he had this great policy of never saying anything. <laughs> so we would read these texts and we'd have these questions and we'd have to work these out between ourselves. The students would have to like, what, 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 what does it mean here? And so we would be focusing on trying to un unpack the text. And we're like, what, what is pragmatism? And we would look at him and he would just, he'd kind of shrug. <laughs> yeah. But this gives us kind of answer to that, that uh, feeling because exactly. it, it never ends because these are living generalities and you participate right, with right. them and they create new meaning by being implemented in new situations and right, it never right. ends. It never you ends. Know, you, never, um, you never can, you know, say ultimately what something even means. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah, in some ways there there's a um I'll, have you there's a, a friend of mine who's written about about Plato, a person Plato. Uh oh, David um uh he'll I'll get his name here in a second. Um yeah. but uh Purse was had been reading Plato and quoting a lot in his later works, um, and and Plato also has this element that the only good thing about inquiry is that it's always ongoing, mm -hmm. and so philosophy is really just the technique of continuing to pose questions, so that inquiry will never completely close. Um, so. Yeah, it, I think I forget the title of his essay. Person, uh, no, hang on. <clears throat> oh, it's something about miracles. He he's doing. He he wrote about. Oh, I'll think of his name here in a minute. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, but but then the sentiments they are changed through through inquiry through logic, right? Right. <laughs> and well, that is. Uh, yeah, you so the through so the inquiry brings our sentiments to a kind of self control, or that the goal is to by self and self controlled inquiry to explore the sentiments uh, in order to kind of to bring them to you know fuller articulation, um, but also to see how how they extend in further kinds of habits and development. So I think this this notion that that sentiments are <clears throat> are not simply blindly controlling us, but that we have the ability to um, un understand them, but also modify them through inquiry. I think makes them, you know, this this sort of middle ground between what we what we take up through experience, but then what can be developed in relationship to um, our inquiry. So that we become clear about our sentiments, so they're not blind. Uh, so we're not simply following something that we're we're, we're just taking up uh, wholesale. Yeah, and this again sounds very much like uh, what what the church speaks about uh, desires and mm -hmm. uh, passions and stuff like that. Right, right. Like un unexamined sentiments are like passions. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, this just like all the time I read this book and I was like, oh, this connects here and this yeah, connects yeah, here. Yeah, and yeah, there yeah. are a lot of like interesting ways to, to yeah. further develop this. Right. David O'Hara uh, is the is the person I was okay. talking about. O'Hara. Okay. I'll write that down. Yeah. He, had, he wrote a really, really nice essay on person in Plato. You really read my book. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, it was, I, I, must, I, I must be, I must be honest. It was a very dense read. It's a yeah. very <laughs> dense book. My, like, my mom, bless her heart. You know, she's not trained as a philosopher, but she's a mom. And so she really wanted to read my book. <laughs> so she got through like the first two chapters, you know, the, the, the biographical part was pretty cool. Uh, she could follow that. And then you got to like chapter three, and she was like, "Sorry." <laughs> yeah, I, I read it. I read it the first time, and I was like, "This is a very good book, but I don't understand." Like, <laughs> I understand maybe twenty, like 10, 20 percent of, like, of it. Then I read it again and made like extensive notes, like, and I I spent so much time, like three pages. I had three pages of notes. But Sorry. Was, no, 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 no. It's it's those kinds of books. Like yeah. I really liked it. It it, it was like a, a gold mine sort yeah. of. It, and really, it it was a, a a different kind of experience because I read the book 
oh, I read the book, I read like two sentences and then, oh, uh, this may connect here. And then I yeah. have my own ideas. And then I read another two sentences. Oh, this no. probably connects here. And like, no. it's a very like rich, dense, but rich book. Yeah. And even, even on the first time I realized there's a lot of good stuff in here, but yeah. I just went over my head. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I have to be honest when I, you know, the one thing I thought when I started writing this book was that I didn't want to write <clears throat> like a whole survey of Purse's career. Yeah. And yet that's exactly what I wound up doing. <laughs> and, but the other thing was I, I had, of course, over my career, I'd written about different, you know, of these texts at different times. And so I had sort of an idea, something was going on here. I think I knew what it was, wasn't exactly yeah. sure. And this writing this book gave me the up, forced me to, to read these things in a fuller context. And, and then to, follow Purse's logic between like these series of essays in a way that I had never done. And then I found yeah. not a lot of other people had done uh, to try to follow his reasoning from essay or lecture to lecture to lecture in ways that just really changed what I understood was going on in the first place. Um, and that was hard, but it was really, really cool to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and this is a very unique perspective. And yeah. I, I really liked the way that it was structured around this lecture series. Yeah. And always before you started the series itself, you told a little about the facts about which, which was the situation in person's mm -hmm. life and who was there and what was the yeah. impact of these lectures. And it gave sort of a, like, I felt I was almost there yeah. hearing these lectures and yeah. you know, it yeah. was very ni nicely, nicely done. Yeah. But it's a very odd way to do that to, constrain yourself only to these lecture series yeah. and not yeah. use the whole corpus of purse. So yeah. Why, why did you end up? Well, um, <clears throat> I had to make, had to make choices. Um, mm. And when I was reading back through the, the whole, the whole group of his texts, um, I knew which ones had given me the most question or the, I was most perplexed about. And those are the ones I realized I needed to, to understand myself better. Um, and so I basically just, I followed uh, my instinct toward those series of lectures that seemed to me the most opaque in my understanding. I mean, I understood a part of them, but didn't understand how they all fit together. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I, how I based my selection. Yeah, I, I think you were not alone. I think a lot yeah. of people hearing those lectures were quite lost. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine hearing some of these lectures, you know, and like the uh, the 1903 lectures. Uh, William James says, you know, they were, you know, glimpses of brilliance against Cimmerian darkness. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that's that's pretty. It's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a great quote. That's yeah. A great quote. <laughs> and, and another thing I really liked, you know, is the theme of the book. Uh, you know, religion is often overlooked, although it was very important to Peirce. And, yeah. you know, there are different kinds of Peirce scholars. There are, you know, naturalist Peirce scholars or, or, or scholars who just take one aspect of Peirce, like, uh, you know, the logic or, or whatever. And, you know, even the metaphysical things are sort of a thing that people want to distance themselves right, from. Right, right, right. But, you know, even amongst the metaphysical persons, then the religion is the stuff, okay? Well, religion is something that we don't want to have yep. any contact with. But yep. I really appreciate that you are you are going all the way. Like, you're really... <laughs> <laughs> and and by, by that, I mean that you're really um, trying to understand Peirce, like how he saw himself and his system of thought. And that is something that I really take seriously as well. If religion was so important to Peirce, mm. then it must play a big role in his whole system of philosophy because right. he's a cynicist. So <laughs> exactly. he's connected. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah that's, I think that's, uh, that's brave. I, I really, I, I deeply appreciate the, the, the reading that you've obviously done. Um, and this, and this, uh, assessment because I've, I've, I've been interested to hear how how Persians really think of the book. I've gotten some reaction um, mm. and you know the you're right that 
the metaphysical Persians want Perse to remain a really abstract metaphysician. Mm-hmm. And introducing religion seems to to concretize that in a way yeah. that makes the metaphysicians a little nervous. Um, <laughs> and I, I I completely understand. You know, if you have a, a you know a sort of a speculative metaphysics, you don't want to get it you know bound up in something as earthy as religion. You know, <laughs> and yet, yeah, yeah. But from a pragmatist standpoint you know, where we think that everything begins in experience. Well, religion begins in experience. And so even if you're talking about metaphysics, at some point, it's got to trace back to some experience. And most often, humans have understood that kind of experience has having to do with something like, you know, the gods or God or the the order, whatever it is that stands over uh, and, 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 brings us, you know, to this kind of understanding. Um, and I just thought Peirce was really honest about his um, his own religious convictions in a way that I think would be helpful for me to, to, to examine and, you know, see where it takes. Yeah, and it, it really concretizes this. And, you know, the, the transformation idea was really like, I really liked it. And it, it, it spoke to me on a very deep level mm. because that is something that I have in my personal life felt mm. that when I begin to, began to to read person, really trying to understand person, not just on an intellectual level, but to really like how how could I perceive the world yeah. through this this way of thinking and and you know, it, it transformed yeah, the way yeah. I, I thought about things. You know, it, it yeah. made me uh, like more more uh, perceptive of, you know, sentiments <clears throat> and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Uh, and uh, m- made me appreciate uh, uh, sort of uh, maybe more aesthetical. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right, right. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I think that this this kind of. Uh, bringing sentiments and reason together and and you know reasonable sentimentalism or how you want to yeah, say yeah. it but, right. but it, it really speaks speaks to me in a sense That's and cool. and you know i i have uh i, I know that transformation personally like what's that is about what that's yeah. about and uh, yeah. um but you know the religious ideas that people have it's, it's very natural because you know reality is general, and <laughs> of yes. course there is some living tendency or generality that right. we we perceive and yeah. that we we conform to. So I think that it's it's much uh, more odd to think that the reality could be condensed to a set of propositions. <clears throat> like that is very foreign. Right. To, Exactly. And that's like, that's a crazy idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, one thing about, about this book, again, was the idea of nominalism being a code word for atheism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he got this from his, um, uh, that, that preacher that, that he came across at Harvard when he was an undergraduate, yeah. uh, associated nominalism uh, in this way with atheism. Um, and I don't think he ever he he never really rejected that, but he did see his own tendency toward nominalism all the way through his own career. I mean, he would he would use this as a self critique, right? Uh, what did he say? Um, he looked back at his 1878 essay at one point uh, when he was writing pra- his his work on pragmatism, and he says that my earlier understanding of the pragmatic maxim was was nominalistic and so he's actually identifying himself uh along this tendency so it becomes it it becomes not just an identifier of um a a philosophical you know category to to avoid but it becomes a tool for his own self-examination which i think is really interesting you know that there's still this tension within his own thought between what he understands as nominalism and realism and that it's it's always it's, it's never just a, a done deal. Yeah, that's comforting because I recognize yeah. the nominalist tendencies in my thinking all of the time. <laughs> all the time. 
<laughs> yeah, all the time. It's so hard to be be a triadic thinker or whatever, yeah. what, what you call it. <clears throat> yeah. uh, and then it was this uh, aspect of, I guess this connects with pragmatism, that if you uh, participate with living generality or if you hold some kind of worldview, I guess that's almost the same. Uh, then it's quite interesting, some of these... Um, materialistic beliefs like determinism like if you if you declare that i'm a hardcore determinist mm -hmm. that doesn't show anywhere in your action like that doesn't transform you at all right right that that it's and i think could you go as far as say that that is meaningless to say something i like don't know that? that it would be meaningless i think it would be a source of error that if you yeah. really pursued it you would find that it's not it's not coherent in the long run um and I think this is his um, kind of the, the free will, you know, the free will debate that he kind of yeah. engages follows along the same line. Um, because basically, if you if you think things are determined, then there's not any space for genuine deliberation. Um, and if there's not any way for genuine deliberation to occur, then there's no there's no probability that we could actually bring about a different change we couldn't bring about a different circumstance uh if we if we wanted to but our lives are so you know we we live in our lives so so frequently where we know exactly that what we do is going to change the circumstance so we, we can't really hold to this deterministic model and and really agree with ourselves and most of what we do with our habits which is changing our habits to to bring about a different outcome um, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's clear. But I I really like the, that idea that because I heard determinists say like uh, responding to this critique, like if you believe in determinism, why do you care? Why do right. you even engage in this debate? And they say because you know I I can't otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. how would that look yeah. if I would be a determinist? It wouldn't look anything different so right in, right in that sense it's completely meaningless to say something right. like that and then contrary when a person you know um becomes part of some religion everything changes like it's a complete transformation exactly right right and that's like a very big contradiction because yeah or um, i don't know contradiction but a difference difference between those kinds of ideas that one doesn't affect anything right and one changes everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really good to to talk about. It. I haven't, you know, I'm in the middle of again, like I said, I'm working on a on another project, and I remember how much, you know, putting putting that book together took a lot of effort, and I was thinking yeah. about this next project, thinking, do I really want to do that again? Because <laughs> 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 it's it is a real it's a it's a soul examining process yeah. you know I, and i think this is what's interesting about philosophy um if you really engage it it'll it'll bring yourself you know to a different different level of clarity um yeah yeah and, and i think our whole notion of science is a bit <laughs> a bit backwards it's yeah. too nominalistic because i i'm not sure but i have this kind of uh idea that science in the ancient world meant something like connecting with the divine yeah something like yeah, that yeah. we have discovered this fantastic thing called reason and logic and now this mm -hmm. allows us to connect with the living generalities right and at some point i don't know at which point <laughs> yeah, it right. became like yeah we have to just collect all the propositions and put them in books right yeah and that's yep. science. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was the effort toward ubiquity. We, you know, to be yeah. really comprehensive, we need to to make make it into a techne. Yeah, yeah. But but it was sort of a way of life. Absolutely. Philosophy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are, is there, is our next book about purse? Uh, I have purse in the in one chapter, and yeah. then I kind of do. I I'm kind of following a trajectory from purse and sort of an idealistic community uh, to Jane Adams, who does amelioristic community and follow these two strains through American philosophy. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. 
Yeah, you'll like the title. Community and the Salvation of American Philosophy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I must read that one. <laughs> I've got to write it first. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that, Roger. All right. Hey, it was nice talking to you. Great to talk to you, too. Thanks. Yeah.